Well, I will, I will say a few words to open this important meeting. I know the laureates are important to, to talk, so I will talk very briefly. On behalf of the University of Sao Paulo, I extend our heartfelt gratitude to the Nobel Prize laureates, Professor Sid, Dave, and May Bright, for gracing our university with their presence. I also wish to congratulate FAPESP, the Brazilian Academy of Science, and the Nobel Prize Outreach for their commendable initiative. This meeting will certainly serve as a catalyst for our students and faculty to further their research endeavors. The groundbreaking contribution to quantum physics, asymmetric organocatalysis, and the pivotal role of the cells in the entorenal cortex have enriched the global science discourse. We hope that the laureates enjoy their stay in Brazil and at our university. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, this is being transmitted, so good afternoon and good night, depending on where you are. For me, it's an honor to be here. The Nobel Prize Dialogue is a result of the same year, uh, on another online meeting to discuss the value of science. Uh, and uh, with 24 Latin American countries and the Caribbean, and uh, for the theme United by Science. Now, thanks to the efforts of a pleiad of people who work together towards setting up this event, we are honored to welcome and thank again my Brit Moser, Serge Arosh, and Dave McMillan for giving their time to discuss the theme of beating our future together with science with the next generation that's sitting here and watching us on the screen, represented by undergraduate, graduate, and young researchers. This is the second event of this kind that we hold. The first one was on Monday. So now we can say we have two events already in Latin America and the Caribbean. And uh, I want to say that uh, this event is also part of the celebration of the ninth anniversary of University of Sao Paulo. And uh, it's a new university from this state and that we are really, really pleased that now is part of uh, the selective group of the best 100 universities globally. This year, Brazil also is the host of the G20. And the precept, I'm going to repeat a little bit myself from where I apologize for that. But it's a different audience and it's the motto. This Nobel dialogue is also part of the S20 activities. Furthermore, the fifth Brazilian National Conference of Science, Technology, and Innovation is taking place in the beginning of June. And this meeting of the Nobel is part of the conference, representing one of the events dedicated to youth. These debates will contribute to the youth recommendations for the fifth National Science, Technology, and Innovation Conference. I want to thank the efforts of several stakeholders, and special thanks for FAPESP, FIESP, and University of Sao Paulo. A special, very special thanks to the fabulous staff from Nobel Prize Outreach, as well as from the Brazilian Academy of Science, who have worked hard to achieve this goal. Our most special thanks to FINEPI for the financial support to all these events. 
and also to each one of you that are participating in this most relevant ceremony. Finally, I want to remind all of us that in September 2015, 193 countries approved a global agenda to be achieved by 23rd, aiming to free our people from the tyranny of poverty and protect the planet. Bold and transformative measures were outlined with our governments, committing to embrace then to steer the world towards a sustainable and resilient path. These actions are integrated and indivisible and must balance the three dimensions of sustainable development, the economic, the social, and the environmental. Also, this collective journey is anchored in science and in the commitment that no one would be left behind. We are seven years away from the established deadline. And we concern, we realize that we are still far away from the desired and agreed upon goals. So I ask each one of you, young generation, to embrace science, to embrace education, to transform the globe. Thank you. Your Excellencies, dear Nobel Prize laureates, uh, speakers, students, ladies and gentlemen, uh, colleagues and friends. Welcome to the Nobel Prize Dialogue. As Helena said, we started this event in Rio de Janeiro on Monday and continue here today in Sao Paulo with all of you. That really makes us all very happy. My name is Erika Lanner. I'm the director of the Nobel Prize Museum in Stockholm and also here today representing the Nobel Foundation. The theme for the dialogue, as you know, is how to create a future together with the science. Humanity is indeed facing a lot of short and long-term challenges and we need to find the way for science to help us build a better world. We will have the chance today to listen to our three Nobel Prize laureates. We'll get their perspective on what has driven them, how they've uh, overcome setbacks um, and uh, how they've also managed to communicate their findings with their colleagues, with policymakers, and with the wider public. As you know, the Nobel Prize is named and, and invented by entrepreneur and, uh, and inventor Alfred Nobel. He was convinced that we can shape our future if we put our trust in, but, but also see the beauty and the combination of the natural sciences literature and art, peace, work, and politics. He also knew that this uh, takes a continuous quest for knowledge. It takes collaboration, and it takes the courage to make wise, fact-based decisions. And we who work with the outreach activities around the Nobel Prize, we know that they're a great source of inspiration for people, young and old, uh, all around the world. And uh, we facilitate dialogues of this kind to show the importance of staying curious and open, yet critically minded. Many of you today are here as students and uh, from Brazil, but also from countries all over the region. Uh, and I hope that today will make you think about how we together can make society to, to get the most out of what science uh, can contribute with, and the academic world in general can contribute with, so that we may create the future that you want and that you deserve. Um, and you, students, are of course immensely important here. We really love to have you as an audience, but, but that's, not, uh, 
that's not all of it. The, if you listen to the Nobel Prize laureates, you will hear them emphasize again and again the importance of you because the future of science will lie in your hands. We're really happy to be organizing this event together with the Brazilian Academy of Sciences. Uh, we've had a good cooperation for many years and developed a strong friendship and we're really uh, happy and uh, grateful to uh, the entire Brazilian Academy of Science and it wouldn't of course have been possible without Helena Nader who we just listened to. I would I also like to give a special thanks to the University of Sao Paulo and Rector Carlos Gilberto Carlotti Jr. for providing this fantastic venue and allowing us to be here today. Uh, the Nobel Prize Dialogue in Rio and Sao Paulo 2024 is organized by Nobel Prize Outreach and the Brazilian Academy of Sciences with the support of the Nobel International Partners, 3M, ABB, Capgemini, EQT, H2 Green Steel and Scania. Thank you so much for making this possible and thanks also to event partner Klabin. A special thanks to the Embassy to Sweden in Brazil, of Sweden in Brazil, the General Consulate in both Rio and Sao Paulo, and the Swedish Chamber of Commerce. Thank you. Obrigada. Good morning, everybody. My name is Adam Smith, and it's my very great pleasure to be your moderator for this morning's discussion about the art of being a scientist. As you know, you'll be meeting David Macmillan, Maybrit Moser, and Serge Haroche, listening to some of their lessons from their lives in science, but also discussing with them what it takes to be a scientist. And I'd like to thank you all particularly for being here. It is absolutely marvelous to see this huge audience of young scientists. It's a, it's a joy to be here with you. The morning will be divided into two parts. First, you're going to meet the laureates individually. We'll have a conversation with David McMillan, then Maybrit Moser, then Serge Aroche. And then I'm going to bring all three up on stage for a big discussion about the responsibilities of, of being a scientist and perhaps the qualities uh, that you need to be a successful scientist, whatever a successful scientist is. And we'll also discuss that. So to start, I'd like to invite David McMillan to join me on stage, please. Please welcome him. So, I better check the time, make sure everything yes. runs on time. No problem. <laughs> David, you were awarded your Nobel Prize in 2021. You're the most recent of our laureates. It's all quite fresh. You were awarded during the pandemic when things were a little odd and you weren't perhaps yes, asked, to, uh, really asked to move away quite as much as um, you are now. But you run an extremely active research lab. You've got, what, 45 people in the lab? Okay. Yeah. So we've got a microphone on we in the room. We need a microphone, I guess. I, I don't think no, no. I think okay. Serge Haroche's microphone is on. Yeah. Good morning. Yeah, mine's mine on? Yeah. Yeah, yours is on. Good morning. Could we, could we turn Serge's yeah. microphone morning. off, please? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Serge. Good morning. Good morning. Let's assume it's off. No? Nope. Um, so. Let's go for it. Let, let's, let's carry on. So, I suppose this, the straightforward opening question, and this discussion, by the way, today will be very relaxed, and sometimes we'll be talking about it, general it, things. It's lacking diversity. Um, I'm sorry, t Jacob, could we make sure that Serge Haroche's microphone is switched off because it's coming across? Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, David. So, um, how's it been? How's it been these first three years? Uh, how's it been? Um, I think mine's is now switched off. Oh, there we go. How's it been? Um, it's been crazy. It's been crazy. To win a Nobel Prize is crazy. It's one day you're a chemist, you work in your lab, 
no one really cares. And then, <laughs> and then I remember I tried to have a Zoom call with my friends the evening before I found out I won. And no one wanted to have a Zoom call. And then the next day, everyone in the world wanted to talk to me. It was the strangest, <laughs> strangest thing. So it's been incredible, amazing, surreal. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it feels honestly like an incredible privilege because you get to meet so many people. You get to have the chance to talk about what other people are doing in their science and people want to talk to you. So it's been incredibly fun. But at the same time, you know, you still are asked to go around and talk to people about, for example, the value of science around the world. And you suddenly realize you're also, on some level, you're asked to take on a responsibility to be an ambassador to a certain stage, which is something I've learned to take very, very seriously. But the last thing I've found, and it took me maybe one year to realize this, deep down inside, I'm a scientist, I'm a chemist. I love doing chemistry, and so, Getting back to what I do, first and foremost, being in the lab, doing great science, being excited about hopefully having an impact, that's been the, the number one thing. So if anything, it sort of taught me also what I truly, truly love about what I do even before I won the Nobel Prize. That's nice. It's reminded you. Yeah. And I suppose, yeah, doing great science is all about knowing what your priorities should be and sticking to the goal. Right. Do you find that it has interfered with research? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, as you mentioned, I have a group of 45 people, and here I am in Brazil, uh, enjoying Rio de Janeiro and enjoying Sao Paulo and having fantastic caipirinhas. And, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it interferes, but it interferes in a very, very positive way, right? Because the vast majority of things you're asked to do is to broaden or explain what it is that you're doing to people or what it is the science you're doing. So although it interferes, you learn how to, 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 to be that and live with that. So it's very exciting. So if I'm in lab and I'm doing some really things which are fun, that's great. But when it's sometimes you face adversity, then you can go and have a trip to Brazil and, it, and it's really wonderful. So uh, yeah, there's, there's nice interferences as well. We have this sort of conversation with laureates all around the world in front of audiences of young scientists. And today we've called it the art of being a scientist. Sometimes we call the session how to make a scientific impact. What would, how would you, if we, if we take that phrase, scientific impact, how would you define scientific impact? Yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, scientific impact, there's various ways you can have an impact. First way is fundamental fundamental research, you might do something that no one seems to care about, and then 20 years later, it's incredibly important to everything that's going on around the world. In, you know, in chemistry, we have many, many examples of that. But there's other impact where I tell people, I tell people in my group that they can invent a reaction on a Monday, and by Friday, people in pharmaceutical companies are using that chemical reaction. And when they realize that's happening, they get very excited because they suddenly realize this small world that they think they're in actually reaches out to this much, much larger world. And people really do care about what it is that we're doing. So impact is really important, in my opinion, whether it takes a small amount of time or a long amount of time. But ultimately, having an impact, I do think, is important for science. Mm. It's the part that reminds us why curiosity and learning and thinking actually impacts us all as a society. It has that impact. And of course, you awarded your Nobel Prize for the impact of asymmetric organocatalysis on the world in general. But when you were undertaking the research, when you were going down that path, what impact did you have in mind? How did you think <laughs> of what you were trying to get done? What did I think I was trying to get done? Well, I just become an assistant professor at Berkeley in in US. I'm Scottish, so I was in America. And when you become an assistant professor in America, you get six years to get tenure. And if you don't get tenure, you lose your job. So the impact I was hoping for would I would get to keep my job. That was <laughs> that was my first impact that I really cared about. But ultimately what I was thinking about was more I was looking at the way that we were doing all the things that we were doing 
and asking myself, okay, the, the way that chemistry works in this one area, everyone does it this way, does it, does it make sense? And some of it made sense, but some of it seemed sort of strange to me that we were doing it in this bizarre way. So I started to question, is there other ways to do it? Is there other ways you can think about it? And that's when we started to have ideas about going in this completely different direction. So when it worked, the impact was I, I was happy, I was satisfied, I'd convinced myself that we could possibly go in a different direction. Did I think that the world would jump on to that direction? Not necessarily immediately, but fortunately that's exactly what happened. We were very fortunate, very lucky. You have to be lucky as well. And through being fortunate, and everyone sort of jumped onto that area, it grew and grew and grew, and just the excitement kept going with it. I mean, so for all the young people in the audience who are thinking about how to choose their questions, choose their direction, what you've just described is this balance between stepping back and thinking, what are people doing wrong, what's missing, and the extreme focus of just saying, okay, now I need to, I've, I've chosen the question, I need to pursue it. How do you get that balance right? <laughs> It's really, really hard, especially when you're a young person. Uh, you know, I, I sometimes say this, and I can say it now because I'm a Nobel Prize winner, but sometimes, you know, it's incredibly important to have funding agencies for all of science, but sometimes funding agencies themselves are great, but sometimes reviewers for funding are difficult because reviewers are often looking for things that make sense based upon what we already know. Mm -hmm. And sometimes young people want to go in a completely different direction that makes no sense compared to what we've already known. And unfortunately, it's difficult to get funding to do that. That's the, that's the problem. And so we end up doing the things which make sense instead of the things which are more unusual or higher risk. And that's the real balance, I think, for a young person. They have to try and sort of walk that where they can make sure they have the resources to do everything they have to do, but also have this component of what they're doing which is definitely high risk, or definitely different, enough so that they feel if this works, they'll be really excited about it. And by extrapolation, everyone around them should be really excited about it too. That phrase, they should be really excited about it, is that the test of a good high risk project that it's just you want to do it? It's, yeah, it's, I, I mean, I, I think we were talking about this the other day, and my internal guide for this is about every five to ten years, I, I have an idea, and I think, wow, that's really cool. That's really cool. And people will say, well, what does that mean, it's really cool? And I say, I don't know. I don't know. It's just, it's cool. I just can feel it. It seems really cool. So at the beginning, you're always trying to, it's all about, Tell, you subconsciously or consciously sort of feel this feeling that you inside yourself are like, I am really excited about this. <laughs> this is going to be something, if it works, I'm just going to be so happy that it works. And it's number one, it's kind of for you. Mm. It's kind of this internal thing that you care about. But if you care that much about it and you have that feeling about it, typically it's the case that everyone around you, when they see that idea, is going to feel the same way. So it's a really nice internal metric. Is, is it cool or is it not cool? Is it cool? That's, that's a good take-home message. Um, during t today's sessions, I really want to bring in lots of comments and questions from the audience. It would be really nice if those comments are short, so it can be a, it can be a question, comment, whatever you like, but keep it short. It can be in Portuguese or English as you wish. We have, we have devices to translate here. And I I'd love to start now. If anybody would like to ask a question of David, we have another nine minutes or so of David on stage, Feel free, you don't have to, but if there's any, there's a, there's a hand up there. Is there a microphone that could reach you quickly? As I say, let's, let's keep it all moving, so keep it quick and short. Go ahead, please. Just tell us who you are very quickly and then ask. Uh, good morning, it's a pleasure to be here and to ask the question. My name is Rafael. I, I do maths here in the University of Sao Paulo, and I would like to ask, uh, if you ever stopped about giving up, and <laughs> how do you overcome it, you know? Everywhere we go in the world, that question comes up right at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's it really, the, I always tell people also, you know, after I won the Nobel Prize, the, the number one question you get is, how do you deal with failure? I'm like, it's a weird question to ask someone who just won a Nobel Prize. How do you deal, <laughs> yeah. how, how do you deal with failure? But it's what you do, as we know as scientists, we deal with failure much more than we deal with success. And so the question of giving up, 
There are those days you're like, why am I doing this? This is like hitting my head against a wall constantly and getting no reward. Um, but then there's those days when it works. There's those days when it works, right? I, my favorite thing in the world, you know, when a, when a student and, you know, you've been working on a project for a while, it's just not working, and then a student will walk into your office, usually in chemistry with an NMR, and say, can I show you something? And when a student says, can I show you something, it usually is not something bad, it's usually something very good. And when that happens, and I'm, I'm getting sort of goosebumps even talking about it, it's the most amazing feeling in the world, because you suddenly realize that this piece of knowledge that was unknown to the world on a Tuesday is now going to be known forever on a Wednesday. And that's the most, I, I just, that to, to me is the one of the most stimulating things in, about science is how we're continually contributing. Everyone in this room who does science is continually contributing to what society is going to benefit from. So while there's certainly days you think about giving up, there's those amazing days where are just like, you feel on top of the world just because you've been part of this process of giving new knowledge to the world. It, it's wonderful. But when you don't have a lab and you're all on your own and your NMRs just keep out coming, coming out wrong, how do you get over that feeling that it's just never going to work? It's, it's funny, when I was at Berkeley, we bought this very expensive piece of equipment for my group when we first started. And every day I would go to this piece of equipment to see the result. And every day it failed, 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 failed for six months. Then one day I walked in, the piece of equipment, there was the, took out the thing, and the, there was one peak and, and it, I, something was working. It was working. And I ran around my lab and said, whose is this? And it turns out it wasn't from my lab. Someone from a different lab had <laughs> borrowed the machine. And it was that moment of like, oh my goodness, is we ever going to succeed? But you realize you just have to go back and you have to keep going to a piece of paper or a, a blackboard or a chalkboard and you just have to keep your enthusiasm for you know at the end of the day you're going to get there. Going back to the failure question, we fail much more than we ever succeed. We know that, we accept that. We're amazing at dealing with failure. That's what scientists do. But at the end of the day, we know if we keep going, if we keep going, we will, reach, we will definitely reach somewhere that will be valuable. Thank you, Raphael. It's such an important question. Thank you. Do we have another one? Oh, there's one just here. Sorry, I, I'm, I, I know I can't see everybody, so I apologize if I'm getting it wrong, but there's a lady just here with a hand up. Bad. Quickly get a... Sorry, I'll try and be... I'll try and get... To everyone. Thank you. Oh. Um, hello. Uh, my name is Flora. I also study here in University of Sao Paulo. I study chemistry. And, well, you talked about, like, the coolness factor of an idea. And I, I would really like to ask, like, a simple question. Um, what is the coolest idea or reaction that you've worked on or <laughs> researched? Like, I'm just curious. <laughs> so, um, I'll, try, I'll try and give an answer. So, yeah, uh, yeah, I think so. I think so. Sorry, the microphone's... His mi Keep going. Okay, I'll keep talking. Will I yell? I can shout. <laughs> Jacob, can we bring back the microphone? Maybe Serge could answer it. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, well, I'll just shout. One, two. No, we'll have to wait. So, this is, this is we I'm have to wait for your microphone to be on. One, two, one, two, one, two. Maybe somebody could run out and one, check it. Is it the batteries on the... No, no, it's the green light's back on again. Oh, there we go. Yep, All good. Right. Okay, you're on. So this is my conspiracy. This is my conspiracy theory. Someone asks a chemistry question and they shut off the microphone. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it always happens. Um, no, but I'll, I'll try and give an answer which hopefully won't be too technical. But um, we've worked on a lot of different things and... There's lots of things that I love, and all the things you work on are like your children. You, you love them all equally. However, we recently published a paper last month on a chemical reaction that took us 17 years to solve. And I've been talking about this reaction for 17 years to the point all of my colleagues and all of my students are so bored listening to me talk about this one chemical reaction. But we finally solved it. 
and we published it, and the response from the community was fantastic. And it was so, such an amazingly satisfying thing, not just because of the response, but because it was one of those things that you always wanted and, and you think will be valuable. And now you see all these people actually in pharmaceutical and agrochemical who are already using that chemical reaction. So for me, that's something which was just, it was because it was so hard fought for along the way, it was something I thought was extremely cool. But for Flora, the chemist's benefit, you better say what the reaction what it was. actually was. So what it is, around the world, there's all these molecules that exist. Uh, they're feedstocks, they're widely available. You're not using up biodiversity by using them. And they're called alcohols. And uh, not just the alcohol you drink, other, other alcohols. And they're so abundant, but nobody really knows how to remove the oxygens and get them to couple with each other. But if you can get them to do that, you will dramatically accelerate, for example, how you can find new molecules for medicines. And it's such a crazy reaction. No one in the world was even really thinking about it, never mind working on it. And we've been working on it for a long time, and we finally, finally got there. So now you can make all these new molecules really, really quickly by doing, taking these alcohols, and, and they only react with each other, which is the other super cool thing about the whole thing. And what would be, in case anybody's listening, the coolest reaction to do in the world, in your the, opinion? The coolest reaction, well, I don't know if it would be the coolest reaction to do in the world, it would be the, probably the most important reaction to do in the world right now, is mineralization of CO2. I always tell people we're one catalytic reaction away from cl solving climate change. And there's an enormous number of alkali metals which exist in our world, and they slowly absorb CO2 to become carbonates. That's the way the world, basically, one of the ways that it removes CO2 from our atmosphere. But it takes a long time. It takes hundreds, if not thousands, of years. And if you can accelerate that process through catalysis, right now, it would easily be the, most, the world's most important chemical reaction. And a lot of people are thinking about it and trying to do it, and I'm optimistic it's going to work but it it's, is the most important reaction. Any ideas in the back of your head? Not that you should say them if you have them, but... Yeah, yeah, I mean, the way that you're, you're going to be able to do that, it's, it's going to be based around, there's two different approaches. Uh, you could potentially use a biocatalysis way of doing it, but you also could use, do this using uh, different types of abundant metal catalysis to do that, which is quite ironic because it's the opposite of what I got the Nobel Prize for. <laughs> so, um, but it would be an absolutely fantastic chemical reaction. But what it also shows, you talking about it, is that you need to keep this perspective on your science. You know, it, it, again, it's, it's the broad view and the narrow view, and right. somehow doing that. Right, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. It is ridiculous to have three different laureates to talk to on stage. I mean, one, one is just wonderful, three is so much, it's fantastic. Thank you very much, David. We'll meet you again in a few minutes. Thanks, Adam. So, if I could invite 20, 2014 Nobel Laureate in Physiology or Medicine, Maybrit Moser, on stage, we'll continue with the next conversation. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Please Hello. take a seat. Hi. Thank you. How lovely to have you here. Um, and it really is. Isn't it incredible to look out on this full room? It's just such a joy. It's fantastic. And so this is, is this your first ever visit to Brazil? Absolutely. And so your impressions having been here for just a few days? It's such a beautiful country, so fantastic people, and so smart, caring, beautiful people. So I would like to hug you all. <laughs> Let's start with that hugging then. Okay. Um. <laughs> okay, Adam. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, the. Um, you run a lab and a research institute in Trondheim in Norway, where I know you take very good care of people. You think it's very important. We to take try. <laughs> well, talk about how you try to take care of the environment of your colleagues and your space. 
Yeah, so what is important for me, and we are going to talk about that later today, is the responsibility of me as both a scientist but also as a leader. And I feel responsible both, of course, for the science we do, the animals we use, and also, of course, the people working with us. And people, a scientist is like an artist. Uh, your hobby is your work. Uh, so you, you spend so much time, and we have so many people coming from abroad to our lab. So if people are not happy um, at work, it's a miserable life, so I've, I feel a bit responsibility. So I haven't been able to tell you the slogan of our institute, and that is, of course, excellent science, which we are really working hard to achieve, but also happy animals. We do a lot to achieve that. Happy people and diversity. Right. Very much. That's so important. So these, these are, as you say, these are all topics that we'll touch on when we talk about responsibilities yeah. later. But, but I, didn't, I, I didn't finish. <laughs> no, <laughs> no so, 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 so one thing is to, to have this abstract idea that people should be happy. But in order to, to try to, to, to make an environment where people can be creative, then you have to see people. So we walk around and talk to people, and you, you look a bit worried today, Adam. Could I help I you? Look, I, I, was, I was looking <laughs> interested. <laughs> That's how so, we do it, yes. exactly. So, so that is how we do it, and, and, and try to, to, to help people. And as we heard David said, to do science is hard because there are so many failures and, and you feel, as we heard from David, you, you, you bang your head to, to against the wall. But it's also like doing mathematics. If you sit or with the puzzle, you sit there and you think and you think and you discuss with people and then suddenly you have the answer. And in this is, this is, I'm a trained psychologist too, so I know that to work really hard and then to get an answer, you get addicted. So that is why I say scientists talk about passion. I would rather say scientists are insane because we are so addicted to what we do, we can't stop it. I think. <laughs> I'm really interested in this idea of exploring whether people feel all right in the lab, because in a way, as a scientist, you have to be, there's, there's a kind of pressure to be an independent thinker, you know, to be confident, to be resilient, deal with the failures, get on with it. And in a way, that's how young scientists have to portray themselves. I'm kind of together. And when you investigate them, just, as like, just like when you just investigated me and said, you look a bit worried, Adam. <laughs> you know, the, the, immediate effect, the, the immediate response is to say, no, I'm fine, I, it's all going well. So how do you get past that? How do you really get inside people? You just read emotions and ask if you read the right. No, so I, 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 I don't want to talk too much about it because I, I, I don't do only psychology in the lab. Yeah. So uh, I think what, what we... I'm, I'm so proud of um, Edward and me that we have been able, especially in our group, been able to create an environment where we together try to solve questions. And when we see some solutions, and it doesn't depend on if this is uh, this person's project or this person's project, we, we solve together and we celebrate together. So to celebrate is extremely important when the lab is doing something uh, that is interesting. And, and, and we enjoy to understand the world uh, differently and to understand something together that we didn't understand the day on a Wednesday that we heard from, from mm. David. Yeah, exactly. On the Thursday we wake up and wow, we understand something we didn't understand yesterday. So you were awarded the Nobel Prize for mapping spatial representations in the hippocampus, in the entorhinal cortex, um, in, in, the, in the rats you use. And so getting, making a huge step towards understanding how the brain represents the world. But this idea of trying to untangle 
the networks that allow us to be conscious of our surroundings is a very slow process. I mean, it, 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 the progress is slow. Many people are trying. How do you approach such complexity? Uh, thank you for that question, Adam. Now, so we, we, we had to, to, to start somewhere, so we decided to start to, to study structures that we were struck, uh, studied before, the hippocampus, and then we moved our way in. So we started by recording single cells, and we discovered the grid cells that we got the Nobel Prize for, which is a coordinate system that you can use for metric uh, in the brain, so you can put it like a blanket, and then you have a coordinate system in the room. But as we know, in your brain and my brain and your brains, there are billions and billions of nerve cells. So if you have just, the f you understand the function of a few cells, that is not sufficient. You need to know how many, many cells work together. And then in neuroscience, uh, different from probably chemistry and physics, we were waiting for the tools. So we pushed, we had ideas, but we pushed, pushed, and then suddenly, a few years ago, we got the access to new tools. So we could then go from recording a few cells at the same time, and that was fun, we would celebrate then too, but now we have thousands of cells. And then we have to use models and mathematics and physics to understand this complex network. And then we found a donut in the brain. And that seems to be a crazy. So we a, do a donut in the brain. A donut in the brain. And uh, we were interviewed in, uh, in the national TV, and we had donuts with us, and so on. So, of course, it's talking about the manifold, the way that this brain activity is working together, these, these brain cells, and uh, it was fitting the theory that uh, had been developed before, telling that it should look like this when you do this manifold um, uh, experiments uh, or, or, or calculations. So we, we reduce this high dimensional, all this activity to a few dimensions, and then we ended up with a donut, and we saw how the activity moved around. It must take you into new fields all the time, because... It, it does. For, uh, for instance, you're now into, into complex geometries which isn't Absolutely. presumably something you had at your fingertips before, so... No, exactly. So we, we, of course, now we have stopped to do the calculations ourselves because I don't know topology in mathematics, but we collaborate with people, and that is why diversity is so extremely important for us, that we collaborate with people who really know their field, and then we know our field, we know where we want to go together with these people, and then we suddenly achieve things that we didn't achieve before and we start to understand something about the brain. What is so interesting, or maybe, no, I shouldn't talk about it because it's not published. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> we are trying to write it up. Well, it's, it's about development. And that, it's so exciting. Well, that, ra <laughs> that raises an interesting point, and I'm going to come to questions in one second, but that raises an interesting point that my you, you don't travel very much. You like to stay in the lab. It's hard to, I mean, it's a, a, it's a great compliment to Brazil that you've come because you don't, it's hard to get you to, act, to winkle you out of the lab and get you here. But that's, that, that's interesting that you, you, you've managed to parcel out your time. You resist most of these invitations because you must be bombarded. So to be honest with you, uh, there's a lady in the institute just writing no's every single day, at least three, four, requests. And, 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 and it's true, Adam. I, I came into science because I was a curious child or scientist, and I'm still so curious that I'm, as I say, I'm addicted to science and to be with, uh, with the people, working with us, doing most excellent science, and to see 
the development, how the questions is, uh, are evolving, how the results are coming together, write up the stories, present it to the rest of the world. It's just such a blessing. So I, sometimes I sit down and ask myself, Maybrit, what, what have you done in life so that you are allowed to be so blessed to understand so much? Thank you. Que questions for Maybrit? Uh, there's one straight in the front, but I won't always go to the front, but let's go here, please. <laughs> Sorry, and then I see one here. Yes, that lady there. Okay. Next one will be over here. This lady with the glasses. Hand raise there. <laughs> Please. Hello, Professor. My name is Marlene Souza. I'm from medical school. I am a PhD candidate in rehabilitation science, and I'm so proud to be here with you. And I have only question for you. I'm from Amazon Forest, and in there we have a lot of women and girls like me that believe that science is only one direction. But sometimes, in another way, we never heard before women like you. If you should, can you share with us on what device, only one, to guarantee more access to women and girls like me in different positions around the world, please? Oh yeah, I'm going to give you an advice that you will never forget. Be a scientist, forget about what tags you have on yourself. Be proud as a scientist. Please. Hello. It's such an honor to be talking to you. My name is Elena. I'm a scientist and a research in biotechnology and cell culture, so it's really nice your slogan like loving animals, I do too. <laughs> uh, the first, I would love to ask you, how many black students do you have in your lab? Because we are talking about the, how to overcome the willing of give up. And for me, it's really important to have an example looking like me in labs from others, other countries or like working with people important as you. I would like to know how many people look, looking like me are working with, with you because it's really important to me to, he, to have this example, please. Thank you, Thank you for that question. And um, I, I wouldn't have sit here and say we need diversity if I can prove that uh, we live uh, after that principle. And uh, in our institute, we have uh, people from uh, 30 countries throughout the world. And uh, we have uh, uh, people uh, with all colors, and we love that. Because we need people, not only colors outside, but inside. We need different attitudes, we need different training, because that is what is enriching us and enriching science. So be proud of yourself. Do, does it happen naturally, or do you really have to work to build diversity in northern Norway? Oh, Adam. <laughs> of course. So w one time, um, we, we, uh, we, we saw a letter for, uh, from a reviewer that we shouldn't have seen. It was an accident. And this was a reviewer from Britain. And uh, he wrote, is it possible to have such an excellent environment in this remote place <laughs> on earth <laughs> and of course when it's so remote why should people come from the whole world to Trondheim because we love science together but do you have to yeah. do you <laughs> okay there's a hand raised down here um, and one up there, please. Thank you. Okay, just can we quickly get a microphone here? Sorry, I'm so sorry. We don't have long, so please. 
morning. Thank you very much for your amazing presentation. Uh, my name is Moacir Miranda. I'm a professor at the business department at the University of Sao Paulo and the, the head of partnerships at the University of Sao Paulo as well. And my question is about the innovation because you, we have over 2,000 research partners, international research partnership, but just a few uh, innovation partnerships. And I'd like to listen uh, from the others, from the hard sciences. What do you think about innovation and the relevance of this subject? Thank you very much for coming to Brazil. Welcome. Thank you. So thank you for that question too. So I'm, I'm from the part of the country in Norway where they say that if, uh, if you take a person like me, nail us to the wall, come back 14 days after, they will still be fat. That is just saying that we are the type of ambitious entrepreneurs in <laughs> Norway. Uh, so innovation is important, but, but even, even if I'm raised like this, in science we share instead of making money as they do uh, where, where I'm from. And I can give you an example if I'm allowed. Um, we had the most brilliant uh, Chinese uh, postdoc coming from Peking University, top, 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 and he was trained as an engineer, doing also some neuroscience. He um, was joining this uh, uh, trend to reduce the two-photon microscope, 500 uh, kilos uh, microscope, down to less than three grams, and make it so tiny that a mouse can run around, climb towers and everything. He came to our lab and did this, and then people from my place would think we can sell it. <laughs> because this is, this is just so fantastic. You can use this microscope and put it on an animal that is running around. You see thousands of cells glowing up like stars on the sky. And you can start to ask, why is this cell glowing up there when the animal is doing this and this? Instead of selling the microscope, we opened up. So we shared every single detail and people have used this material and they built such microscopes all out over the world now and that is enhancing science and that is our aim. So thank you for that question. Thank you very much. Minus 15. I know, we have to stop. Thank you very <laughs> much, my Brit. We'll come back to these subjects shortly. Thank you. <laughs> and now, 2012 Nobel Laureate in Physics, Serge Arroche, please. Thank you, Serge. Thank you. Welcome. So in contrast to my Brit, you know Brazil very well. You've been here so many times. You've yes. networked deeply in, you, in yeah. this university. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're, yeah. You're, you're, you're very well known. So um, it's, I guess it's lovely to be back. Yeah. And you, there are many familiar faces in the yeah. audience. I'm very glad to be back here. And uh, as you said, I have been visiting since uh, the 19, beginning of the 1980s, I have worked very closely with Brazilian colleagues in works which have been recognized by the Nobel Prize, so I want to say it here. And uh, uh, one of my uh, PhD students has now big responsibilities in, uh, in this university, Paolo Nussenzweig, so I'm very glad to be here again. You undertook to do something which was thought to be impossible, which was to manipulate a single photon and to observe it in its different quantum states. So, basic question, what, why did you begin to do something that was basically impossible? <laughs> no, when, when I started a long time ago, it, it was when we did experiment, we did experiment on a huge number of particles. We had a, a billions of atoms in a cell 
interacting with billions and billions of photons in, in light beams. And then I realized that by using new technologies, it was possible to increase the sensitivity so that we would be able to measure things happening with fewer and fewer particles. And of course, the, the holy grail was to reach the point where we would have a single atom interacting with a single photon. And this was made possible by developments in technology, especially by having more and more sophisticated lasers. In fact, I was very lucky when I started my career uh, that the laser was just, had just been invented. And it was quite clear that you could do, that the laser would certainly open new ways to do research, but we had no idea of how well this would happen, how far we, should, we would go with lasers. Mm. And as you said also, what was challenging us is the fact that the founding fathers of quantum physics, uh, people like Bohr, Einstein, and Schrodinger, uh, were imagining this kind of experiments, but they were, at the same time, they were thinking that they would be forever impossible. And when you do this experiment with single particles, you unveil directly the strange features of quantum physics, like state superposition, entanglement, uh, which these people, and, and quantum jumps, for instance, that uh, uh, the founding fathers had discovered, but thought that they were, would never be seen directly because of the fact that you, by working on statistical ensembles, these effects would be forever hidden from us. And, and the fact that we were able to discover, to, to unveil this mysterious world was really fascinating and was uh, uh, the, the deep reason why we worked in this direction. Mm. So as a, as a youngster, getting into the field of quantum optics. Yeah. Did, you, did you imagine this end point, or was it? Not, was at, it, not no. at all, not at all. It was, I was given, uh, first I learned, about, uh, I learned about the laws of quantum physics, which I found fascinating. I was lucky to be in a lab with really charismatic teachers, which unveiled these laws to us, and they gave me a, a lab for my PhD. I had a cell which contained a huge number of atoms, as I said, and I was free to, to in, uh, explore with that. And I understood that in this cell, in spite of the fact that there was a huge number of atoms, each of them was reacting according to quantum laws, and I wanted to see that. You know, uh, there is a beautiful, uh, this is expressed in a beautiful way by Edward Purcell, who was the Nobel Prize winner for NMR. He invented nuclear magnetic resonance, which uh, describes the properties of magnetic moments, each atom in our body, each hydrogen atom carries a small magnet. And when this magnet rotates in the magnetic field, for example, magnetic field of the Earth, it emits microwaves. And the guy who recognized that and was able to use this interaction to start a field called NMR was Ed Purcell in Felix Bloch. And his, in his Nobel lecture, Purcell says that uh, since he made this discovery, each time he goes out and he sees on his doorstep a big heap of, of snow, he reflects upon the fact that in this pile of snow, each proton is slowly rotating and emitting microwaves. And he says that this is a kind of recognition which is a reward of a researcher to understand that something which was not understood before happens and that he uh, just has discovered this for, for the world to know, even before any application. And of course, there have been a lot of application of, of this thing. So at, at my uh, level, I, I feel the same thing, that to, to be able to observe these phenomena which were hidden because of lack of technology before, and, and to observe this for the first time, and to dream about the fact that it might day be useful for something, is a big reward for, for a scientist. You mentioned being free in the lab when you were young to explore. Yeah. How important is freedom, was, it was freedom to you and is freedom in general in, in research? It's, it's, an, it's ideal to be free and uh, uh, this was a case, I think this was more the case in the past because we could do this kind of experiment with less resources, it costs less money than it, it is now. And uh, the research were m was at the time more bottom up than top down. And now there is a lot a tendency to organize research according to programs. 
For example, there are great prog big programs now in quantum information science, quantum technologies, and these programs are directed from the top down. And it, it puts a lot of constraints to the people who are doing this research. You have to propose things, you have to promise results, and this is not the way research really works. Uh, what you do is that you explore things because, because you are curious, and then the applications come very often from unexpected directions. And I think that uh, policy makers should take more care of that and, and understand that you have to uh, support research by uh, trying to build the best conditions for bottom-up research to, to, to spring mm. out and not try to impose uh, the research from top down. It's, it's rather difficult to achieve, but I think it's very important. Mm. No, it's very challenging, as you say, given how expensive it all is now. Yes. But, yeah. What would you say would be the key thing for a young researcher, not just a physicist, to bear in mind as they embark on their career in, in, in choosing questions, in, in, in finding a place for themselves? Yeah. It depends, of, of course, on of the personality of each researcher, so you can only see the, say very general things. I think you have to, of course, they have to be curious and they have to try to uh, focus to recognize a, a field of research which interests them very much. And uh, in my case, it was uh, laser physics because the laser had just been invented and, and there was so much promises that the laser could achieve that I, I went in this direction. But there are now, Today, there are other fields, of course, which, uh, in which you have this kind of uh, promises. It also depends on the personality, as I said. Uh, uh, I, I listened carefully to what Maybrit said before, and I can share that we are working in small, in, in, in small labs. We are working with groups of a few, let's say 10, 15 researchers working together. And in this, in this case, you can build a kind of synergy between the people, young and senior people. You can exchange, you can support each other. I think humor is very important because in, in the research uh, days you have a lot of drawbacks, you have a lot of failure, and if you are not supported by your colleagues working together and, and trying to make fun of these uh, problems, life becomes more difficult. So this is one uh, aspect. There are other big projects which involve a huge number of researchers. I am talking about particle physics, I'm talking about astrophysics, which works in big. Yeah. In, in, so I, if you want to get into this, you need to have uh, the, the right uh, st state of mind, accept the idea that you will be working, be working in big groups and try to find your niche, your particular interest in these big groups. This is quite different. You have to be for, ready also for interdisciplinary work, as was said before, because now research involves a lot of uh, knowledge in different areas. The connection with mathematics is important as for a physicist. You have to, uh, you cannot have all the knowledge in mathematics that you, that you would need, so you have to be able to surround yourself with good mathematicians. This was the case of very famous people, Einstein, when he uh, discovered the general theory of relativity, lacked the knowledge in, in math. Like, for example, uh, geometries in curved space is something that he had no idea about, mm. and he was able uh, to find colleagues who, who explained to him that this kind of math, and this is very important now. It, that does seem very important, the having the confidence to ask for help, assistance, yes. when you need it. Yes. Again, not something that necessarily yeah. comes naturally, yeah. because you're taught yeah. to yeah. be yeah. self-reliant. Yeah. yeah, I can give you an example from my own research. Now, since we are able to manipulate single atoms, now we can organize these single atoms in arrays, and we can simulate what happens in condensed matter physics, what happens when a huge number of atoms which are located at well-defined position interact with each other. And these simulators might help us to discover new phases of matter, which might be very important for technology. For, ex for instance, uh, superconducting at high at room temperature might one day come from this kind of research. But for that, you need to have a lot of knowledge in quantum uh, phases mm. of matter, which is a big field in theoretical physics which gave rise to many Nobel Prizes in the past, but for that, there is a knowledge in mathematics, in topology, for instance, that I have, don't have. And in order to understand what would be useful and what kind of experiments we have to do, we have to interact with mathematicians and with 
specialist in, in uh, theoretical condensed matter physics. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting and very stimulating area, it, but it requires cooperation. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go to questions, but just as we do, I want to ask you, we've called this session the art of being a scientist. Yeah. Do you like that term? Do you think, yes. you, do you think it works? The, uh, is there an art uh, to being uh, a scientist? I, I like uh, the connection uh, that you make uh, with, between art and science. Of course, I think uh, art and science share a lot of uh, things in common. You need imagination, you may need some kind of intuition, you need creativity, and so but the creativity and the intuition come in different forms for art and science. And uh, I think it opens the mind of a, of a scientist if he has some interest in, in topics outside science. Art, some art, and history, history, history of science, history of art is very interesting because they converge. It's, it's very uh, interesting to realize that the great discoveries in science and the great revolutions in art came very often together. If you think about the Italian Renaissance or uh, what happened in, in Germany and in Europe at the turn of the 20th century. It, it was, there was a kind of ebullition in, in art and science which went together and which have certainly influenced uh, big sci great scientists mm. like Einstein, Niels Bohr, mm. and in the past people like Galileo. And, uh, so it's quite, I, I think it's very interesting, very important. Thank you. Well, we'll talk more about the connection between art and science right at the end of this morning. Question right at the back there. Can I, can I go to this? Sorry, I don't know where the microphone is. There, right at the back, on the, on the, a bit further. Yeah, there. That's it. Please, thank you. And then you. Please. Uh, well, first, thank you very much for the, the lecture. Um, my question, as you, you cited, uh, you are you really know a lot of Brazil. You come here and you have even uh, research partners uh, that are Brazilian. So. My question was more of, and as you cited also about history of science, this question was, why do you think there is no Brazilian laureates, like we have Argentinian laureates? Yeah. Uh, why do you think that makes people uh, pursue these, and uh, maybe not pursuing, but uh, achieving this goal, which is, I think, one of the biggest goals of scientists in natural sciences? So thank you very much for the lecture. Thank you. Yeah. Well, that's it. So I think I think it's a it's a tough question. I think now in in uh, uh, modern science you need uh, a lot of resources, and uh, so it's difficult for some labs to compete with the resources that you can get in in, in labs in in Europe or in the United States, who uh, which have uh, uh, had a long uh, experience, a long tradition in in fundamental research and in science. But I'm sure that it will come because Brazil has, in, in, in terms of uh, bright minds and bright young minds, I think you have all what you need. Uh, and, and I must add that you have a lot of resources that you don't exploit because I think the education system by itself at the lower levels and universities is still lacking the qualities that it uh, would need to give equal opportunities and equal chances to all the young people, all the young minds that you have in, the, in this country and also in other uh, Latin American countries. Now, why, uh, for example, Argentina has a few Nobel Prizes and not Brazil? I think it's just a question of uh, chance. Uh, since we are dealing with small numbers to make statistics is difficult, but I'm sure that uh, Brazil deserves at least as much as Nobel Prize as other uh, countries of this kind. I also heard when discussing with colleagues that in fact you have one in, uh, in uh, physiology and medicine, but he left Brazil to go to England in the in, uh, beginning of the 1960s. And so, but I, I, what I, I, this gives me the opportunity to add that, you, that it's at, uh, maybe I should not say that uh, here, uh, especially because we, are, uh, we come here invited by uh, the Nobel Foundation, that you should not, the Nobel Prize should not be a criterion for that. Uh, it's like, it's not, a, it's not a good criterion to count the number of publications in nature and science, and it's not a good criterion to count the number, the number of Nobel Prizes, because it's, it's, it, there is a matter of luck it, it, to win a Nobel Prize, a matter of the fact that you come at the right condition at the right time, 
And uh, I was lucky to get it, but uh, I'm very well aware of the fact that there are a lot of colleagues in the world uh, who, who are doing the same kind of research and who did not have that luck because it turns out that we give only uh, at most three Nobel Prizes in, in, in a given area. In my case, I always regretted the fact that I could not share it with the people who have been working with me during all their career, uh, Jean-Michel Raymond and Michel Brun. And if you want to extend that more, the work that I did with Luis Davidovich and Nisim Zaguri in Brazil was the, the, the seed for the experiment that we did a few years later. And in fact, the Nobel Prize should have recognized all this team, but it, it's impossible uh, because of the rules of, of, of the Nobel Prize. So the Nobel Prize should not be the only uh, criterion. I think that what you need to do is to uh, uh, improve the education at a lower level. This is the kind of question I also get when I am in China. They, they say, why we don't we get? And then it, uh, this, this relates to the question you ask about the connection between art and science. Mm. What I tell them is that, but you get Nobel Prizes. The only problem is that you don't like them. <laughs> Peace Nobel Prizes, we, we were in jail and we died in jail. And Literature Nobel Prize, they uh, don't, did not like because they were critical of the system. And I think it's, so it was a kind of joke, as I did not like it, but I think it's more than a joke. It it's reflects the fact that if you want to have good science, you need to have free thinking and a free world. Of that. The, 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 the academic world must uh, be a free world, and this is one advantage you have here that we have in, in democratic countries, and it's a big advantage. And if I want to be a little bit cynical, this is an advantage that we have because we don't have as much money as China is putting into research. If they have the free uh, freedom and the, all the money that they have, they will overwhelm us with, uh, with their research. And so they, they have a kind of... Uh, uh, string attached to them, which prevents them to develop all that they could have, and we should do that in, in our countries. Mm. Thank you very much, Serge. Thank you for being bold enough to ask the question, because the answer was absolutely fascinating. Thank you. We have very little time, but uh, th we, this person, very quick question, very quick answer, and then we finish. Uh, first off, thank you for uh, the lecture. Quick. So. You mentioned how research nowadays is often done from the top to the bottom. Um, and for a fledgling researcher that... that how, how do I say this? Uh, that, that wants to do that sort of research that's more from the bottom to the top and can, can be kind of hard for uh, even the environment of okay. the, the environment of the, the academic field nowadays uh, what what advice would you give someone like that what what should do we do to pursue that kind of research yeah. Yeah. despite how yeah. okay this to the so thank you very much for the question okay. but the question used up our time so we uh, it's a very good question what advice do you have for people who want to Go from, go from the bottom, not, not work with a top-down environment. You've got no time, so you can, you can come back to it in the responsibilities yeah. thing, or very quick. I, I think the question is more to the policy makers. You have to develop the conditions which allow the research to go from the, from the bottom up. And for that, the research, pro the, 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 research, the uh, environment should give money, should make the system such that the body could be given to bright young people and give them a few years to prove that they are able to do product, productive research. This is how it works in very successful institutes uh, in, in the United States, in Switzerland, in Israel. They give this opportunity to young people, they give them money, and after a few years, of course, you have, you have to evaluate. Some of them will get tenure, others not. So it's a system which in, involves some risk for the young people, but the risk goes with the trust they are given at the beginning to prove themselves. In other countries, and I am, I am not very happy to say that it's the case in France, uh, the system does not work that way. You, you hire young people, you give them tenure from the beginning, but you don't give them the money they should have and the support they should have 
to be able to prove themselves. And from the beginning, you ask them to apply for research grants, which come from the top. And uh, I think it's not ideal. I think you have to combine system which give uh, opportunities to young people to start from the bottom and then to support them from the top later on. Mm. Thank you very much indeed. It's a very important topic, and we will talk about it some more when you're all yes. together. Thank you very much, Serge. Now, you stay there. Yes. I'd like to invite David and Mybrit back on stage, uh, together with two new chairs, two extra chairs, please. And can, can Serge just stay there, or do, oh, well, I'll shift across there. There we are. Great. You, oh, okay. That's it. Fine. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I always think that... Can I ask you? Oh, sorry, yes. No, can I ask you one thing? Oh, yes. A few questions from that side. Okay. Can you sit closer? <laughs> <laughs> I've been ignoring part of the auditorium, apparently. And also from the top, it's hard to see. I and mean, there are no microphones up there, but no, we'll see what we can do. Please sit down. Thank you very much indeed. I always think that one of the remarkable things about laureates, which is perfectly obvious when you think about it, but perhaps is somewhat, it strikes one as initially surprising, is that you're, that you're all such different personalities. And that's one of, the, one of the reasons that we had this, we did this one at a time thing. To sort of sh show show the audience that you're three very different people. Now we're here to talk about. Thank you very much for the session so far. Now we're here to talk about the responsibilities of scientists, which is an enormous topic. May I ask you how you view the responsibilities of the scientist, David? First. That's a great question. Um, it's a difficult question. I would say the number one thing is you have the responsibility to your students and the people you work with, first and foremost. These are individuals who are coming to work for you. They care about you. They care about the research. And you're, as a professor, your job is to help them grow as individuals, as scientists. How do you care about them? Second one, though, is the science you're doing and the impact that it's going to have on society and that responsibility. And that responsibility is, in my opinion, it's important. It's still important that you're independent and you have to find your own path, and you don't necessarily do what maybe a government agency is telling you you should do. You still have to find your own path, but that's important. But the third part, and for all of us, I mean, as Nobel Prize winners, I've found at least, I don't want to speak for everyone else, but you suddenly realize you are this person who is being asked to answer questions on a sort of larger scale about science, um, sometimes to be the defense lawyer, for the field of science, but I think, at least for us, it's an opportunity from our perspectives, and we are all different, to be able to represent to all the people, not just the other scientists in the world, but to people in politics and people beyond, that what it is that we do and why it is important. Climate change, sustainability, these are all obvious ones, but there's other ones as well beyond that where we have to get those messages out as well. Mm -hmm. Does that responsibility extend to all scientists? So, I mean, is everybody in the audience, for instance, who is a scientist an advocate for science, do you feel? I mean, I personally hope they are, um, whether they are or not. But I think one of the things which is wonderful about science is that everyone gets to, in my opinion, take their own path, make their own way. They have to decide for themselves what is their relationship between what they think of their science and how they would explain this or be part of a bigger community and everyone is going to do it differently and it is that diversity of thought which is so critical to science anyway so I think it always comes back to the individual but I think collectively as a group it's very important that we advocate for science. Thank you very much. Serge what about you how do you view this the responsibility of the scientist? I, I, I would like first to come back to the responsibility to the, to the students that we have because we are often embarked in a very long-term project. We have a long-term goal, and, and, and the students, of course, have a shorter horizon. They have to get a PhD in a short time. Uh, in France, in principle, it's three years, which is too short, but let's say even four or five years is short. So we have to find for each student some, a part of the project which will make sense by itself and which will show to the student and make him or her feel that they are participating to a big adventure. So this is one, one point. We are ready to be able to separate the, the field in, in small areas which are significant. 
Now, with respect to the public, I agree with what you said. The first reaction I had when I heard that I had a Nobel Prize was to say, oh, now I will have to be the advocate of science uh, everywhere, and uh, not only what I am doing, but science in general, and find exactly what are the values of science which matter, how we can make policy makers and the society aware of that, and this is a very, this is a very challenging task. Uh, it's challenging for one reason. Here, I think we all agree about what, what we are talking about. So we are preaching in, in front of people who, who, who agree, so, which is very nice, very rewarding, but not so useful. In fact, we should have a room filled of policy makers, of, of bureaucrats, and, and explain to them why science is important. But we'd, we're, we're partly doing that this afternoon. Yes. yes. <laughs> so. yes, yes. <laughs> But then, then the risk is that they will nod and say, oh, hey, yes, you're right. And then after that, they will still do what they did all the time. Uh, and it's, it's difficult. And, and now we live also in a time where we have very challenging uh, issues. And science is, is the only possible answer to these issues, whether it's climate change, the, the, the search for alternative sources of energy, uh, problems related to health and to pandemies and uh, epidemics and, and problems uh, uh, raised with the environment and so on. And for this, science is the only uh, answer, possible mm. answer. So science has a fantastic uh, role to play. Uh, we have to understand also that, uh, and this is what the policymakers are reminding us all the time, that we depend on taxpayers. So we have to explain to taxpayers why it is important to support science. In, in my view, the most important reason to support science is not because it's useful, it's because it's part of civilization. I, I want just to quote a, a sentence which, was, uh, which I think is really summarizes very well. When, when the United States was involved in a super collider, uh, 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 building an accelerator which would cost a huge amount of money, one the physicist was had to uh, reply to, to was in front of a, a com committee of the American Senate, and one senator asked, uh, what, "Is this research relevant for the defense of the United States?" And the guy, uh, the, the scientist, answered, "No, sir, no, but it will make the United States worth defending." Exactly. So I think this is very, very. This, this, this was Robert Wilson. Yes. Yeah. And and he, interestingly was a sculptor as well as a physicist. Yes. 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 So this, this dimension of science as part of culture is, I think, it's, it's what makes our civilization worth living in and worth defending. And, uh, but it's very difficult when you say that to politicians, uh, it's not the right way. I, I, I told one, one day, I told to the French president, okay, what I need is one bit, what we need for our kind of research is one billion euro per year. And you know, one billion euro, euro is, is, is one espresso per month per French citizen. So it's not <laughs> and his answer is that he laughed. <laughs> because of course, it, ho people working in hospitals, in uh, education, in police, in, in the judiciary system are asking for the same kind of amount of money and it adds up. Sure. That's a big problem. My Brit. Your, how the, 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 f the phrase with the responsibility of the scientist, what does it immediately evoke? Yeah, no, so first of all, I would like to say thank you to David and Sash that you say what is important, that we scientists are scientists because we are there, we are talented to do science and we should use our talents to be scientists. And then to be scientists, we work in groups with people, and then we should use our talents to care about our people so that they are helped to do beautiful science. So, and as I said, also, I feel responsible for the animals and the questions that we ask in, in, in uh, uh, my lab. But it's such an important question, Adam, because um, I've, I've, I feel uh, almost like um, people shoot at me about all these responsibilities that people want to give me. And especially as a Nobel laureate, you, you said um, you haven't 
traveled that much in my Brit. No, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason is that I, 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 I know it is important to travel. I know it's extremely important to meet with people both to enrich myself and hopefully enrich also some of the people that we meet. But every single day, I have to be honest with you, I have this discussion with myself. What is your responsibility today, my Brit? Should, should you spend all your time today in the lab with the people discussing science or should I answer a journalist or should I go and talk to the politicians because in Norway we have only five million people in this huge country in Norway so it's easy to get in touch with politicians and it's so important and it's so important for the world and as I told in, in Rio uh, as, as a Nobel laureate, you, you are looked up on as an oracle, somebody who can give answers, <laughs> like we do here. <laughs> and should we give answers? Uh, should we ask questions, rather? And uh, also, as I told in Rio, there are so many requests every single day. My bit, can you join this and this? But uh, I, I'm, I'm so proud of saying yes, for example, to be the ambassador for science and education in Ukraine. They are in a big, big crisis, and even though then this is dragging me out of the lab when I deal with that, it's worth it. So I think to, to find what is worth it, what, what is my talent, what can I give to the world, and I, I send the question to you too, what is, what is your talent, what can you enrich the world with? That is the question that we have to ask ourselves every single day. Thank you. Serge? Yeah, uh, this, I, I think this uh, gave me um, the idea that there is something, some other thing which is very important in our responsibility, which is the transmission of knowledge from one generation to the next. And I think teaching is very important in this respect. I, I have been teaching uh, during my whole career, and one of the big joy I, I feel is when someone which I don't know comes back to me and says, I attended your lectures and I took some benefit from it. I think this transmission is essential, it's a transmission uh, throughout history. We are transmitting the knowledge which has accumulated from the past and which leads into the future. And is, this might be the biggest responsibility we have as scientists, to know that we are part of a chain extending from, from the 17th century to today and, and maybe later on. And we have to defend the values of rationality, the values of the enlightenment, which is, which is what we are for. Can, can I say something yeah, more? Please. Because I'm so inspired by Serge and, and David. Here. This is what this is for. This is for <laughs> you to talk to each other. <laughs> yeah. No. So uh, since uh, since I see so many people here, then uh, I'm talking about all your talents. Not only your talents, but remember your interest in science make you perfect ambassadors for telling about science outside your close relationships. And if everyone here would do that, it helps democracy in the whole world. Mm -hmm. And if I'm allowed, since I'm speaking, I'm very talkative, I'm sorry for that. If, if I'm allowed to cite a singer in Norway, she's singing for children, and uh, she has the name as me, she's called My Britt Andersen, and she was singing this beautiful, beautiful song that our earth is like a balloon, and if there is somebody in Norway, in Brazil, or wherever, putting a needle into this balloon, it all becomes flat. So we should keep together this balloon 
up, floating, so that the world is not collapsing. And scientists, we have more responsibility than other people because we know a lot. Do you, um, do you want to jump in? Do you want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, I, I was just wonder. I was just thinking about you know what are responsibilities and the other aspects of it. I mean, the other responsibility I think to society is, and while I care enormously about communication, and we have to be able to communicate better to society, and we can talk about that too. But the other part is, I think for scientists, we have to invent the the, the modern world. We have to keep inventing. That's what we do, right? And and if we were waiting for other people to tell us what to do. I think we would be in trouble. Now, that doesn't mean to say that we're all sitting around in groups saying, okay, what's the next, what's the modern world going to look like? We don't do that. But what we do do is we have this responsibility to keep thinking about what do we want to do better? How do we want to do it better? And how do we start to think about, and that's literally what scientists have always, I think, been doing. But it continues to be important, and it's only going to get more and more important as we move forward. It kind of goes back to Serge's point about civilization, and I do think that is probably one of our biggest responsibilities is to continue to think about what we want tomorrow to look like. I think that's really important. Thank you very much. I, this is all. This is a conversation, and we can't hear from most of you in the audience, but you can hear from each other. So, what I'd like to do is to just put the conversation to you for a minute. And if you wouldn't mind, for the next couple of minutes, turn to your neighbor and take one minute to tell your neighbor what you think the most important responsibilities should be for scientists. Whether you're a scientist or non-scientist, what do you think they should be? And then your neighbor could do, take the minute to tell you the same thing. If you don't want to do that, you can take two minutes and just check your phone. It's fine. <laughs> But anyway, you've got, we're going to talk to each other. You've got to turn our microphones off. You've got two minutes. Please talk to each other about what responsibilities you have. And then I'll take some ideas from the audience, a few. So please, two minutes. So the remit is again? What is it? Uh, well, they, they, have to, they have to talk about what they think the most important. Great, yes, I think of. Hi, everybody. Sorry to stop you. I can't tell you how lovely it is to listen from stage to the bubble of your conversation. Uh, it's, it's, thank you very much for doing that. And sorry to interrupt. Right, 
I, I'm just going to go straight to you. If, you. if you had something to add, some new responsibilities to throw into the conversation that we haven't been talking about and you think are urgent, please raise. There's two hands raised here. Yeah. And, I, and over here, there's one here. So can we get some microphones there? And let's, let's, let's be quick. So thank you. Yes, I'm afraid. Sorry, I've given you a task. Yes, OK, we're gonna, you go first, please. Here. Yes, please. Is there anyone uh, who want? Okay, so it's me. Uh, so uh, the question I want to do to you three uh, is: Do you feel that in your area there is a big gap between people who are working in more theoretical branches and the ones who are working in more experiment? For instance, uh, in physics, uh, do you think there? Are uh, there is a big gap between uh, a string theorist, for instance, or is he or should he be working more close to experiment? It's a, be it's a beautiful question. Thank you. I, 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 let's answer it very quickly and then get, get to the responsibilities. In physics, for instance, Serge, is there too big a gap between theoretical and experimental physics? Quick answer. No, no, it depends on what kind of physics. If it's high energy physics, I would say there is a gap because they are trying to find out the fundamental laws of nature, which involve now a lot of mathematics, a lot of uh, very specialized uh, math, and the experiment involve a lot of technology, so there is a gap. But in the low energy physics, condensed matter physics or atomic physics, we are lucky enough that in small groups we can have expertise in experiments and in theory, and we can rely on colleagues who are rather close to us. So I think the gap is is less important. But yes, in neuroscience, it's a big question. Yeah. Theoretical neuroscience. Yeah, and just a small comment. Can I comment yes. on it? So um, the, the gap is uh, decreasing in neuroscience because we need people with mathematics skills and physics. So we, and, and then what we need is people who can communicate yeah. so that we can understand each other. Thank you. On responsibility. Hi, yes. good morning, you all. Thank you very much for the lectures. I'm Glaucia Virena from Faculty of Medicine. Well, I have an open question. Uh, how can we bring science closer to society, to the masses, since that we have the fake news scenarios and challenges in our way? Thank you very much. Well, I'm sticking to my center on responsibility. So how, is our, how do we m match up our, to our, how do we meet our responsibility to bring science closer to society? So I, I personally think it's straightforward. It's, it's a straightforward answer. It's not a straightforward execution. It's communication. The communication is the problem, is the fact that science comes across as complicated and therefore distant for general public. The question is, what, what does the general public care about they care about being entertained, they care about being interested, they care about being curious, and they get that from other directions. As communicators, as scientists, if we can achieve the same thing, we can make the general public excited about science. Carl Sagan in the 1970s, the 1980s, in the US and Europe was amazing at bringing science and physics to the, to the general public, and it worked incredibly well. We have to be able to think about ways to communicate what we're doing in a way that excites the general public, in a way that other things already excite the general public. What about those who don't want to be communicated to, though, who just distrust science? Is, is transparency important, for instance? I mean, do, do, how do we... I mean, transparency is... I mean, to my opinion, you can't be a scientist without being transparent. And it, it's, it's basically impossible. You're not a scientist if you're not transparent. Uh, the trust part is that goes back to skepticism, you know, the, this business about people who are putting out information about scientists as being untrustworthy or skepticism, that's fulfilling an agenda what those people want to achieve. And the problem is it's going out there in a format that makes it easy for many people to believe that this is the truth. This business about getting back to the truth, which you said when we were sitting here, is absolutely critical. How do we develop ways as a society through social media and other things to understand what is an achievable truth, and I mean by achievable truth, where there's a general consensus around what the truth is, and we don't believe there's a political stake associated with just knowledge and truth. That is something that has to be critical as we move forward. 
Thank you. Serge, you want yeah. to uh, I think one has to convey to society that truth is building in a kind of uh, complicated but uh, well-organized process. Truth is based on the comparison to observe things and then to build up theories to try to explain these things and then, then to test the theories again with what happens in nature by other new experiments. So it's a constant exchange between facts, not fake news, but real facts which everyone can observe, theories, and then testing the theories. And that a theory is not something arbitrary, it's not an ideology, it's not something that is equal to any other statement you can do. So we have to fight against relativism, which is not the phys uh, physics theory of relativity, but a kind of perverse relativism which amounts to say that any truth, anything that you can say is as valid as any other one. And it's very pernicious. You have a lot, some people even in the academic world who claim that uh, the scientific theories are social facts, that they are built up and that they, are, they just depend upon what happened in society. And this is very, very wrong. And we have to fight for that, but it's difficult because we, this is possible if you talk to people who have had a good education, an education in uh, the possibility of recognizing uh, free thinking, thinking for itself, critical mind and critical thought. And again, we come back to enlightenment. We come back to basic facts, which basic ideas which were developed in the 18th century in Europe and which should prevail. And now uh, what is sad is that we have a lot of resistance against that, which is building up and we have, we have to fight against that. And this is true also in politics. And uh, Condorcet, which I quoted in Rio a few days ago, was a mathematician who developed, who had a treatise on education in which he explains that. And he explains that the only way to fight against populists, a bunch, uh, 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 against charlatans, is to be able to develop free thinking. And I just want to add something about the Sorry. fact that he had also a theory about the way to vote. And he said he developed a, a strategy, a rule for voting, saying you don't have to vote for one person. This is ready for populism, but you have to vote for lists. And the one you prefer, down. And then what you do is that you eliminate the one for which everybody is against, and then you go up, you vote again and again, and this way you will vote someone who will be the right person. Okay. And no country is applying this, mm. this rule. There's an economics laureate, Eric Maskin, yes. who is very keen on this, on yes. changing yes. voting yes. behavior. But yes, yeah. it's very hard, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we've got so many hands up. Please, very quick points. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Giselle. I'm a writer and novelist, and I write about ecological stuff. And uh, Dr. David said about uh, the coolest thing in the world would be c capturing carbon from the atmosphere. And I would like to know how science can help to not only solve the problems, but prevent, uh, considering our uh, Cosmo, different cosmovision like Brazilian G indigenous people, and how can we work together to, to prevent this problem? Thank you very much. So, I mean, basically, how do we prevent as opposed to actually capture thereafter? There's an enormous, so if you look at what's happening right now in renewables, renewables is incredible. And going, you know, with the way that we're slowing down, the way that we're or preventing the way that we're creating problems with energy is remarkable right now. Renewables are really taking on a life of their own that the, we have never seen before. But again, we're doing a terrible job of explaining to the world that this is actually happening right now. It's fantastic, which is actually happening, which is really, really great. But the second part of that is but you have to invent. And science is about observation and discovery, but it's also about invention. Some people call that engineering, but that's also, I believe it's also science. But that invention, for example, if you could take molecules like methane, and using sunlight, you could actually convert to any kerosene for airline fuel. You're never going to change using fossil fuels for the airline business. No one's ever going to use electricity for that. But you have to come up with ways of massively reducing the amount of energy that goes into getting your hands on those fuels. And you can literally think about doing that using the sunlight in the sky. So that is going to be one way for prevention of using up all that energy to allow our modern world to exist. Thank you. Thank you, David. Please. 
Uh, thank you for this opportunity to talk, to talk here. I have a question that is regarding more about ethics in our research environment because we are talking about discussing here how we have this immense pressure to publish because if we don't publish, we don't get funding. But we also have to leverage that we have to publish uh, results that are highly reproducible. So I have heard reports from other people just completely fabricating their results because, oh, if, if we don't have this result, we won't, we, we won't get funding. And we, if we don't get funding, we won't be able to do any more science. So how you three as Nobel laureates do this balance between publishing and getting funding and to also ascertain that your result is a real result? Thank you. Once again, public, publication is a topic that comes up with every audience of young scientists. It's so important that, that something's gone wrong with the system. Quick comments on, please, from all of you on this question of quality versus quantity and the, public, the publication system generally. Who wants to go first? I can go really fast. Go on then. In chemistry, in organic chemistry, it's easy because everyone's going to use that chemical reaction the following week. So <laughs> if, it was not, if it was fake, you would be out of a job and within 10 days. <laughs> really, really easy in chemistry. And what about high, le what about high level publications versus... So the, the, I would say the high level versus the low level, you, you, do your, you do your best and you call it great, right? <laughs> you know, so you, you do what you think is the coolest thing and you send it to the journal that you believe that it should be in and then you sit back and wait and see what happens. But you cannot force that. You cannot end up in a great journal just because you want it. But if you keep going after the things that you genuinely think are important, you will continually end up being in good publication uh, environment. It will happen to you, but you can't just get it for wanting it. It has to be based on how good the actual science is. Thank you. My brain. Oh, I waited for oh. you. <laughs> Search first. I, I think the issue of uh, ranking of uh, citation index and ranking of publications is very perverse in science. I, I, there is a strong pressure for, to publish, especially for young ambitious students who want to get a good postdoc position to have paper published in science or nature. But we have to understand that the publishers are not scientists by themselves, and very often they, are, uh, they, they create some passion, and there are some feeds which, are, which become fashionable, and they push these feeds, and so it becomes an advantage to publish in these journals. And I think this is bad, and I think people should, uh, young people should be evaluated not through the quantity of the citation index, but through qualitative uh, judgment, which is much more difficult. There are some countries in which this has reached very uh, caricatural uh, attitude. For example, in China, some so students at some point were receiving extra money if they published in yeah. a paper like that. And I think, I think they are going back now and not, not applying these rules anymore, but it, it's it's well, very but so that, I mean, there have been these excesses, but wh wherever we have this conversation, exactly as you say, you know, the, 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 there needs to be a change to the system. Yes. But nobody ever has an, a solution. It's, you know, the, the, the system is as it is, and it's very difficult to see how that reward system can change and people can avoid yeah. just going down the same track yeah. as the generation before that it's all that the that promotion and everything else is dependent on getting these high profile publications and i guess it's of concern to the majority of the audience that they're thinking how are they going to yeah. cement these do you have any does anyone have any suggestion no, I, for change I, I, I think you, it's right it's very difficult to change in my group I, my personal experience that i i feel the pressure of the young people to publish in these journals i i don't want to do it but i, I in the end, I accept this idea because I, I don't need it anymore, mm. but they need it. So it's, it's very, it would be very selfish to not to do it. So we have to play the game. And it's, uh, I think it's one of the very bad aspects of uh, the fact that our lives are now controlled by, by uh, computers. In fact, this ranking thing was impossible in, uh, 40 years ago. Nobody knew how many people were reading or pretending to have read our, our, our papers, and, and I think it was much better. So, thank you. I, I don't know how to fight against that, but I, I know that uh, uh, the universities at the top of uh, the, the best universities are trying when they hire people, 
not to use this criterion as a main criterion, but they try to, to make a kind of qualitative assessment of, of the quality of the, the people they have. Thank you very much. Margaret, very quickly, and then I want to come okay. to this question. No, so I started out by saying that um, the slogan at our institute is to do excellent science. And I think that is extremely important that we strive to address important questions. And I, 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 it's, it's, it's difficult because uh, sometimes it is very difficult to get funding for science, even in Norway. But if we think about it, that there are some questions that are so important that we address them, that we put all our resources into that. So that's one thing. And then the second thing, I would like to defend these beautiful journalists like uh, Nature, Sci Cell, and uh, Science, and so on. Because the way we use these journalists or journals is that we send our stories to these journals and we get extremely good feedback back and we spend one year or so to, to, to write the manuscript in such a way that is a really, really solid story. So when we have such stories that we feel we could send them to nature and science, we get a lot of help back too. Okay. So it's, it's not only to be decorated, because I think to, if we have the urge to be decorated in science, we shouldn't do science. We should do science because there are important questions to be addressed. Thank you. Please. Um, hi. Uh, maybe you have no idea about money in research in Brazil. It's extremely, extremely low. I have worked in all country, in all continents, and I can say that we do not do science. We do miracles here. So I'm going to make a short question to each one. Uh, let's suppose that uh, we have an important disease and we have two projects and you are called as Nobel Prize to decide which project you would found. One would be a traditional way that uh, had a high possibility of uh, giving some uh, good result. And the other one had a very low possibility, but it was very creative and maybe could change innovation in medicine. Which project, and there was no way, you had to choose <laughs> one or another one. Which one would you decide to give the money to? I, I would choose to no longer be a Nobel Prize winner. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you want to answer the question? It's for each of you. Very quick, like tiny answer. <laughs> which, would you, which would you fund? No, so um, we've been in committees where we have such questions, and then I would fund the one that I was sure was a high risk but a high gain project. Serge? Yeah, it's difficult to, re to respond in the abstract way without knowing what other project, but I agree with what uh, Maybrit said. If there is a chance that the high-risk project gives a fantastically important answer, then I would favor it. But uh, the ideal thing is to be able to, uh, to, to fund both kind of projects which are useful. Thank you all up three very much indeed. Up I here, please. Up here. Up here. Up please. here. Okay, go on. You, you've made it. Well done. Yes, please. Quickly then. Uh, I'm running out of time, so very quick. Thank you. Um, eu sou Isabel. Eu estive no Rio de Janeiro. Estou aqui mais uma vez. Muito obrigada pelas falas inspiradoras de vocês. Uh, Serge, é, essa questão da, da limitação das normas, eu falei isso numa conferência da Unesco que eu participei. E eu fiquei muito feliz de ouvir você falando sobre isso, porque eu penso que a arte e a ciência são, elas podem caminhar juntas e elas são necessárias para que a gente desenvolva a investigação e a pesquisa. E as minhas aulas de neuroeducação perceptiva, eu ajudo estudantes e professores a desenvolverem toda essa criatividade com, através das artes, através das ciências humanas e sociais. E uma pergunta que eu gostaria de deixar aqui... É, como que o, o até provocativa e reflexiva como que o diálogo Nobel os próximos podem ser 
mais é, participativos com o, os jovens cientistas, e não só os jovens, os cientistas que estão aqui, inclusive os cientistas que não estão nas universidades como eu, porque através das minhas aulas eu descobri como identificar pessoas com transtorno de déficit de atenção e hiperatividade em apenas cinco minutos e meio. Você é uma inspiração para mim, porque eu faço isso através da educação dos sentidos. E muito obrigada é, a todos. Thank you very much indeed. It was um, a lot to summarize. Uh, anyone want my job? The, the, you, um, the lady works with um, art and science, working with groups of young people, um, teaching creativity, nurture, nurturing people, and also uh, being able to identify problems that young people have. And she was mentioning the idea of having young people involved in our dialogues and how important it is to have that. And indeed, we did have that. We did have lovely conversations in Rio de Janeiro just two days ago on Monday, where Serge and uh, Mybrit and David were talking to young people. But synthesizing a question out of it, and we we're out of time. I suppose uh, I'm going to stick to the art and science bit and also come back to creativity and give you like 15 seconds each just to summarize how, how do you view creativity in science? How important is it? Is there a connection with art? I know there's a lot there, but can you say something really, really brief to finish off? So, oh, Serge, you're on the hot spot. Go for it. No, what, what I... Uh I think as creativity is very hard to define, especially because it's different in, in art and in science. In art, creativity allows you to imagine everything. You have a work of, you, you, you can ima imagine a new way of painting, a new way of writing. A science fiction writer can imagine anything can, going faster than the velocity of light to other stars and planets. In science, we are restricted by reality. We, we are, we are talking with nature, and so we cannot imagine anything. In fact, we are discovering things which exist beyond us, and so creativity is more in the way you are able to build tools which allow you to explore nature. And a lot of creativity comes from that, either because you are able to relate different aspects of reality in new ways, or because you invent new tools which allow you to explore nature. For example, in the 17th century, when the telescope was invented, when the pendulum, when the, uh, mm. uh, ato the cro pendulum clock was invented, these were creative tools which made the uh, uh, science, uh, modern science revolution possible. So this is creativity in, in science as opposed to in art. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. My Brit. So I think uh, creativity is extremely important in uh, science and by having an artistic mind, as you say, Serge, with imag uh, Im imagination, you can use the diversity in your group to imagine something that you didn't understand before. So I think art and science go hand in hand. Thank you. I would just add that creativity is it's an amazing term, right? It covers so many different things. I think from a scientist, the creativity is the component of how do you think differently? Or how do you introduce new ways of thinking? Which is so critical for everything that we do in science, all the way down to problem solving and being able to see solutions that other people cannot see by connecting things which at first seem very disparate but ultimately can be connected. The one thing I'll leave you with, which might be different from how other people think, I don't know, but I do think that creativity can be taught as opposed to being inherent. And I do think that people given an opportunity to be taught can become extremely creative, and I think that's really, really important for science. Mm -hmm. And back to the point that this lady was making and was made earlier, that presumably it's a great thing for science if more diverse views can be brought in adding creativity from all sorts of different angles. I know there are so many questions, there are still hands up, but my clock says minus, minus, minus. <laughs> and I know that uh, we have another event to get to, so we have to rush. And I'm just so sorry that we can't take all the points. Uh, I I'd love to know what responsibilities got discussed that we've missed. There must be many. But anyway, um, for preparedness. the- Preparedness. Preparedness and sustainability. 
two words for the next dialogue, preparedness and sustainability. <laughs> Let's have one on that. Good. Um, I just wanted to thank our three laureates, and I want to turn it and thank you, the audience. And I, I also wanted to thank, sorry, the technical team who put all this beautiful thing together. It's really... An enormous effort has gone in from so many people, so thank you. And I'd like to turn the stage over now to Helen and Nada from ABC just to give the closing remarks. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Adam, thank you so much. I'm really, I'm too emotional. I have been crying down there, really, because it's a dream. We made it, and we made it thanks to Ibrit, to Serge. Sorry, <laughs> I'm really getting Hello. old. It's terrible. <laughs> really, it's a. She's just crying. It's a she, dream that we started several years ago. Then the pandemics came, and couldn't, we couldn't make it. Then we had a terrible lack of democracy. Don't forget, science, you need democracy in order to have the freedom to do the creation. So we are going to go home with several thoughts. And each one of you, young generation that is sitting here, have a responsibility because you're going to be ambassadors for the ones that weren't able to be here and transmit. And we, as Brazilians, have a responsibility because we are the privileged ones. We are the ones that have gone to education, were able to get to university. We are professors, most, most of us here, in public schools, and we need to do our part, as they said. And each one is going to find a way of doing. It's not going to be the way my Brit did, or Serge, or <laughs> David, David yeah. but each one of you will be able to change the world. We need to believe in that. So I want to thank again the Swedish embassy that I forgot in the beginning, the ambassador, she was with us all this time. I want to thank Fapespi, Zagui sitting here and in his name everyone. I want to thank University of Sao Paulo, all the staff, all the bravos, and all the students, the other universities that are, did collaborate in this, University of the Estado do Rio de Janeiro, UERJ, as well as FINEP, and uh, who else gave Clabin, <laughs> and all the other sponsors. It's a long list, but I think they did it right because we accomplished what we wanted. Thank you so much, and thank you for really believing in Brazil and the uh, Brazilian Academy of Science that we promised we would deliver something and I hope we deliver it right. You did, but I thought you were crying at the memory of five years of working with us to get this organized. <laughs> <laughs> it was fantastic. We got to know so many fantastic people and uh, he's always char uh, challenging me. We did the first online with all states from Brazil and the federal district. It was a success, and then Adam said, we need to do something else. And I said, well, it's not, nowadays it's impossible. So we moved to Latin America and the Caribbean. Now we have this going on, and he's already planning another, I don't know what, that we are <laughs> going to have here. So. To each one of you, again, thank you so much. And to everybody that came from Sweden and all our staff from the Brazilian Academy of Science, 
Thank you so much. Without you people, this would be impossible, even with the funding. <laughs> <laughs> so believe in yourselves. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. <laughs>